What we're going to do tonight as we're walking through um, Mark chapter 10, we're going to be in verses 13 through 16, so if you want to kind of prep yourself and get there, um, we're going to see that Jesus' teaching is going to move away um, from the teaching that we did on divorce that was last week, that heavy topic. We're now moving to something a little bit lighter in a way. And what we're going to do is we're going to find ourselves back to a familiar discussion dealing with a familiar um, word or phrase uh, regarding matters of the kingdom of God, regarding matters of the kingdom of God. And that phrase that that I mentioned a little bit earlier, we're going to find this term children or little children again, connecting to some previous points that Jesus had mentioned before. And those previous points that Jesus had mentioned regarding children were the following two questions. Um, How Jesus views the children. How does Jesus view the children in that context in that day? But also, secondly, how do the disciples, how, how rather should the disciples see children? How should they see children? And although we have um, four verses that we're going to be covering tonight, really the impact of the text will move us to see how hearts can be detached from eternal matters because of our current human perspective, our ways, and our thinking. If I were to kind of outline for us some thoughts through the text tonight, we're going to see about three things. First, we're going to see Jesus address the disciples' rebuke. He's going to address the disciples' rebuke, and that's going to be in verse 13. We're then going to see Jesus address who can enter the kingdom. Who can enter the kingdom? How does one enter the kingdom? That's in verses 14 through 15. And then we're going to see Jesus setting an example. Jesus setting an example. So we're going to be in verses 13 through 16. And if I were to put a tag on tonight's text, it would simply be this. Suffer not the little ones. Suffer not the little ones. So with that being said, I invite you to open up a copy of your scriptures and meet me at Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. And this is the reading of the word of the Lord. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God will, like a little child, will never enter it. Verse 16, and he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. It's the reading of the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word that is unchanging. Lord, your word that pierces your word that corrects, your word that instructs, your word that heals. Lord, I pray tonight that you will meet us here, that by your spirit that you will teach us the text, that you will open up our eyes to behold wondrous things in your law, that you will open up our minds that we will understand the scriptures. Lord, it amazes me how as we look at the life of Jesus and how he teaches the disciples that he teaches with such compassion and he provides the grace that is needed to move them from infancy to maturity. And Lord, I ask that as we approach the text tonight, that will you help us approach it in a way that we can be confronted with ourselves, to see ourselves, so that we may be able to live in the way that you've called us to live and to do the things that you've called us to do, not in our own strength, not in our own ability, but by your strength, by your ability, because you are the one that has brought it about. So Lord, I pray that you humble us tonight. I pray that you open our hearts and our minds to receive your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Well, as a father... 
one of the things that I absolutely love to observe within my own children is their total trust in mom and dad. And you may be able to have that similar experience where when you had children, your children at a young age looked up to you and knew that they could trust you in all things. That there's this knowing that in all things, mom and dad have our best interest at heart. That they're going to provide our every need as long as we depend upon their provision. And as we get older and grow, it's, it's interesting that as we become adults in this life, that our ability to depend upon our Heavenly Father moves from that childlike dependency to more of an independent stance. It's almost as if we've lost that childlike reliance as when we were younger. And this sense of life is oftentimes, friends, blurred because of the worldly things that come about that we come up against and we feel like we can do it on our own, we can make it on our own. Rather, what we're going to see in the text is Jesus using this beautiful illustration of children to say, friends, this is how one enters into the kingdom. This is how one comes to really dive deep into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So with that understanding, let's dive into the text, starting with verse 13. People, again, were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. It looks like these disciples just aren't learning yet, right? So it's after Jesus' difficult teaching on matters surrounding divorce that Mark mentions people began bringing their children to Jesus. Now, although the text does not specify for us who the people are specifically, we can assume based upon social and cultural norms during that time that the people more than not were probably the women bringing their children to Jesus in this circled teaching. And if you're looking at this from the outside looking in, in a way one could think, man, this is a good thing. The kids are coming to Jesus. They're going to spend time with Jesus. Jesus is going to bless them. What a sweet opportunity this is. However, Mark mentions that the disciples took issue with the women bringing their children to Jesus. And in the disciples' displeasure of this scene, the text tells us that the disciples rebuked the kids. They rebuked the parents. And it's important to note that the disciples, friends, are not necessarily rebuking the children per se, but rather the women who have brought them to Jesus. And to make matters worse, again, the women are bringing the children in the middle of this crowd right right after the conversation that Jesus is having regarding divorce and marriage. Now, question is, why do I mention this in light of tonight's passage? Well, to understand this moment, we have to consider two things. The first thing is, who is bringing the children? We've done that. We've considered that. But the second thing is this, the status of a child during that time. What is the significance of understanding the disciples rebuking Jesus at this moment or rebuking the children at this moment? We have to understand that women during antiquity did not have the extent of rights that women today have in our free world. Uh, Women were not owners of property or possession during those times. Therefore, their stance in society, although above a child, was not ideal. And in the same way, a child during antiquity was considered unimportant and lowly in society. Therefore, in the minds of the disciples, the question became, Who are these women and children thinking they can just come up to Jesus and waste his time? This is Jesus' time here. In other words, this interaction was beneath Jesus. And therefore, it was beneath the disciples as well. Therefore, out of frustration, the disciples rebuked the women for sending the children to be blessed by Jesus. Well, friends, this begs a question and really a thought to be recalled, and that's this. Why would the disciples withhold the children from going to Jesus? It's almost as if the disciples forgot 
how Jesus addressed the importance of the children not too long ago. You, you may remember in Mark chapter 9, verses 36 through 37. I want you to turn there with me really quickly and check out what Jesus stated about the little children. Check out what he says. Taking a child, he set him before them, meaning he set the children before him, or that child before him, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one child like this, in my name, receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. So it becomes clear that the disciples have not learned from the lesson from prior regarding this issue of exclusivity and elitism. That where there seems to be an opportunity for the children to be blessed by Jesus and to draw near to him, the disciples see this as a hindrance and as a nuisance. As a matter of fact, the word for rebuke here in the Greek is a very strong word. As a matter of fact, it's an aggressive word. It is a forceful warning that expresses great disapproval. And because of this attitude towards the children, Jesus' response towards the disciples will be both a public correction and a teaching moment. Check out verses 14 and 15. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. So Mark, friends, is really setting the scene for us here. Jesus is seeing the disciples in real time, in essence, shooing away and aggressively criticizing the women for bringing their children to Jesus. And this rebuke becomes both visible, visibly and verbally apparent because Mark mentions that Jesus became indignant. The word indignant in Greek is ag anakateo, which means to arouse to anger over something unjust and wrong. And in this case, Jesus' compassion for the children becomes visible based upon his infuriating anger towards the disciples' actions. So Jesus, in his anger, tells the disciples, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. If I were to put it another way, permit them to come. Don't stop them from coming to me. So from there, Jesus then mentions why the little children should not be hindered to come to him. Check out what he says. He, say, he states, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. What a profound statement, that the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Remember that Jesus has used this illustration of children before regarding greatness in the kingdom. We saw that in Mark chapter 9, verses 36 through 37. And he spoke about how receiving a child, as he demonstrated before, not only confirmed their embracing of the Son, meaning embracing Jesus, but it also meant that they were embracing the purpose and the plan of the Father. In other words, taking in and serving those who would otherwise be deemed insignificant in society is close to the heart of God. So where the disciples are seeking to neglect and reject the children in this setting, Jesus is saying, friends, you're missing the point. You're missing it. Do not prevent the children from coming, but rather you should be leading them to me. Jesus was using this moment to convey the reality that the kingdom program is about reaching people like these children, both figuratively and literally. Jesus needs the disciples to see that the point of their ministry is to serve those in whom the world deems to be the unreachable, the least, and the lowly. 
So it becomes clear that Jesus uses children here metaphorically, representing people in society that are deemed unvaluable. If we were to think about it, friends, in today's terms, you can think about the orphan, the homeless, the downtrodden, the abandoned, etc., etc. If I were to put it plainly, even the least of these needs the Lord of all. Psalm chapter 34 verse 18 says this regarding the Lord's care for the brokenhearted. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. You see, this effort of service for the kingdom of God is not and should not be a sub-ministry in the local body of Christ, but it should be the core of the kingdom program. You ever met churches that sometimes have mission as a spinoff of everything else that they do? Instead of missions being the focal point of what they do because the point of being the church is to go out to be able to reach the lost so that they may know and to hear and respond to the gospel. So what the disciples' reactions showed at this moment is that their understanding of their mission had not fully been grasped yet. That where they're looking to make an impact in the world for Jesus, they tended to overlook the very ones at whom Christ came for. This reminds me of what James spoke about in James chapter 2 regarding the sin of partiality. You might remember where it came down to this particular scene where the rich were coming to the front and they said, oh, no, you come on and sit up here. But when it came down to those who were poor and, and, and brokenhearted, oh, go ahead and sit in the back over there. Don't worry about this seat up here. This is what is happening, friends. So where the disciples see the poor in status as insignificant, Jesus sees them as the perfect candidates to receive the kingdom. And as we'll see next week, Jesus extends this teaching point into matters regarding the rich young ruler. If I were to put it this way, both this teaching and the rich young ruler go hand in hand regarding how one enters into the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, James chapter 1 verse 27 is going to also speak to the priority of seeking to serve those who have no sense of power or privilege. Check out what James chapter 1 verse 27 says. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. Check out what James writes to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So James lays out the fact that the essence of true religion, true relationship with God, is found in one's ability to serve those who could never offer anything in return. Here's a question that we should consider. If no one ever donated to a ministry you served in or a church that you belonged to, would your effectiveness of ministry change? Secondly, would your motivation for ministry change if it meant that you would not have a platform to be seen or known by men? Thirdly, would your motivation for ministry change if you were only preaching to 10 people rather than 10,000 people? In other words, our true heart's intention should be wrapped up in glorifying God and introducing people to Christ rather than concerning ourselves about a bottom line or an inconvenient factor. Well, they don't really know the Bible that much, so I'm not going to waste time with them. I'm going to deal with the Bible study fellowship people. As a matter of fact, (laughs) give you a real example. I I remember there was a church that my wife and I were serving at, and we were being considered to plant a church in downtown San Antonio. And we're pumped up about this opportunity because we've we've taught in the inner city, we've served inner city students, and we loved it. Matter of fact, we lived in the inner city for about a year. However, 
what ended up taking place is when it came down for this church, I'm not going to name them, to consider planting this church downtown, here was their response. I don't think we're going to plant the church there, guys. It's, it's not going to generate enough money for us. Needless to say, that was a clear sign for me and my wife to leave that church. You see, friends, the purpose of the kingdom program and sharing the gospel is that all people are in need of it. Regardless of their zip code, regardless of their educational level, regardless of their age, etc., etc. So Jesus' correction of the disciples is that these are the ones... These little children, the ones in whom you deem insignificant, the ones who you see as unimportant, such as these, they are being brought here so that you may serve them. Why? Because it's their meekness that is going to be able to get them into the kingdom because they they understand that they cannot get to God unless they put trust in the provision by which God is made. Friends, the kingdom of God belongs to those who recognize that they bring nothing to the table and that that we must trust in him, trust in Christ completely. Why? Because he is the only way. And it requires humility for the believer that we come to the end of ourselves realizing I can't earn my way into heaven I can't work my way into heaven. I can only come to the realization that it's because of what Christ has done and me believing upon that that saves me. So Jesus continues on in verse 15 by mentioning that anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom, check this out, like one of these, will never enter. You see, to understand what Jesus is saying here, we need to understand metaphorically what he's saying. As he speaks to the entrance of the kingdom, he connects it in a positional sense and not an associative or familial sense. In other words, like a child is dependent and trusts their parents for their provision and their daily need, so should a person depend upon God's means and provision for eternal life. It's that childlike faith. And that all we need to enter the kingdom, friends, as I said before, is an abandonment of our own will and to place our trust upon the Lord Jesus for through him and in him is our fullness and security, not ourselves. You can't do it. I can't do it. Only Christ can do it. If we were to be honest ourselves, friends, for some believers, there is this tendency to believe that our proximity or our theological knowledge of Jesus can somehow save us. And the dangerous frame of thought can cause a hindrance for non-believers and even young believers to truly miss the power of the gospel of God. Friends, there's a difference between intellectually knowing God and experientially being transformed by God. If I were to put it differently, being reborn. The only way in which you and I came to faith is the Holy Spirit opened up your eyes so that you may see. And then in that, that moved you to say, I see it, I believe. It is the illumination that brings about not only transformation, but it brings about that glorification. So, friends, the danger that we run into in Christendom is that if someone has been in church all their lives and they feel like they have participated every Sunday and at every Bible study and they've given faithfully their 10% or whatever they want to give every single Sunday, week after week, however they want to donate, however they want to tithe, that they feel that that's their ticket into heaven. Or if a person knows a lot about Scripture, And they know every single word in the Greek and the Hebrew and they know how to say this and they know how to interpret that. That they think that somehow the knowledge 
saves them simply by osmosis. Friend, salvation is not based upon you or I performing an intellectual exercise by merit, but rather it is based upon what Jesus Christ has done for us and us resting in that. As a matter of fact, there are several implications that come with this reality that I mentioned earlier. And one particular that I would like to further expound on, again, it deals with the phrase and the literalness of the phrase, like a child, like a child. And as we approach the text, it comes without question that God receiving believers in the kingdom does not exclude children. I mentioned earlier that the thought of the day was that children were not held in high regard, especially with regards to religious matters. Or when, when they get older, they can worry about coming to know the Lord. That We don't need to worry about training them now. However, the text seems, friends, to suggest that even a child has a place in the kingdom solely because of their trust in Christ, because their eyes have been opened. Again, this begs a significant question for us today, as well as a significant warning. And we're going to see that in verse 16. Check that out with me. Verse 16 says this, And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. He blessed them. So Jesus rejects the disciples' dismissal of the children coming to him, And he sets an example for them, for what true ministry is to look like. That where the disciples saw hindrance and an inability for the children to receive or even understand the significance of Christ's ministry, Jesus saw the children as the perfect recipients of his ministry. I mentioned that there was a significant question that comes from Jesus' acceptance of the children and the disciples' rebuke of the children. And at the same time, friends, there is a dangerous warning that should be had here as well. The question that should come about that we should ask is this, how are the children able to come to saving faith in Christ? How do they come to saving faith in Christ? And that answer is this, the same way in which all believers come to faith in Christ. And that is through the illuminating work of the Spirit of God. And see, we can oftentimes make these silly assumptions that God couldn't possibly be at work through young children. Some may assume that children um, may not understand deep theological matters, that somehow they couldn't come to faith at such a young age. Well, friends, children at even a young age have the same opportunity for the Holy Spirit to open up their eyes. Age is not a factor. Just as much as mental or physical disabilities is not a factor. If I were to provide for us just one example here in the New Testament, we see John the Baptist, where in his mother's womb was filled with the Holy Spirit to do the work in which the Father had called him to accomplish. We see that in Luke chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Now, I recognize in you hearing that, that you may say, hey, John being filled with the Holy Spirit, I mean, the purpose of that was obviously for him to be a forerunner for Christ. Yet it doesn't dismiss the point that's being made here, which is God's sovereign calling in salvation is not limited just by adults at a particular age that I have to be 30 or 35 or 25 in order to come to faith. No, foolishness. That whether God called you at six years old or God calls you at 96 years old, God by his spirit opened your eyes and called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And notice that this drawing and that this calling is not initiated or controlled by man's interference but rather by God's doing within the hearts of men and women. Now, here's the other thing that you might be asking. Well, what are the dangers, Wes, in discouraging or hindering children from coming to Jesus, taking time with them, spending time with them in that way? Well, if you remember, the danger becomes 
when we saw the disciples having this hindering moment with a particular individual who was called by God to do some particular things. And what ended up happening is the disciples in and of themselves were trying to be gatekeepers. It's this equivalent to the warning that Jesus gave them in Mark chapter 9, verse 42, where he says, if you try to hinder the children from doing what I've called them to do, you might as well tie a millstone around your neck and be thrown into the depths of the sea. That there is seriousness in the matter in which Jesus is speaking to as it comes not just to babes in the faith, but also children in the faith. Again, I, I want to make sure that I make this very clear, make this very known, that when we think about faith in general, we have to ask the question, what is it? What is faith? Faith is placing trust in God's provision for salvation, and that act of saving faith can take place within a child. It can take place. The reality is that faith, friends, is not initiated because we confessed with our mouths. But rather, faith is something that happened in your heart. It happened in your heart. And over time, something prompts you to confess. For some, there is a time gap between this expression of faith in the heart and the confession of faith from the mouth. And this looks very different for many different people. Again, this is why faith is not an intellectual exercise, but a miraculous work within and by the Spirit. And as we see Jesus' compassion towards the children and his teaching on the kingdom, friends, it becomes a picture of how the church would need to engage even the least of all. The purpose of the church is to meet the needs of the people God sends our way that they may first be spiritually edified and satisfied fully in Christ. Secondly, through meeting that spiritual need, the physical needs can then be met in the process. If I were to put it differently, this is how we can end up garbling the gospel. There's a difference between true biblical gospel where your ministry is about first proclaiming spiritual truth so that transformation can take place rather than social gospel. And you probably see this in many different um, organizations, especially during Christmas time, where their goal is to feed the needy, to help the hungry, to help the homeless. But there's no gospel presentation that happens. If you want to know how does true ministry look when it comes down to those who are seen as the least of these, are poor in spirit, are brokenhearted, it first begins with the presentation of the gospel. It begins by meeting that felt need. And in that moment, God provides an opportunity to interject the gospel. But if the gospel is going to be this last thing that you consider or never touch it at all, then we've missed the point of ministry in its totality. We have to remember that we've been called to proclaim the gospel of truth to people all over. It doesn't matter what their age is. It doesn't matter what side of the tracks they're on. That all are in need to hear and respond to the gospel of God. So what do we see from the text tonight? We see, friends, that all people, young and old, are in need of being met with the gospel. That we must check our personal prejudices at the door and seek the opportunities that God provides for us to minister to whomever, whenever, wherever. We also saw that our jobs as ministers of the gospel and sharers of the good news is to meet the needs of those around us without strings attached. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. The reality is, as a minister to those around us, we must recognize that this work that God has called us to will oftentimes be a thankless opportunity. Don't expect 
those who do not know the fullness of the gospel to somehow tell you thank you for what you do. Because sometimes you may not ever get a thank you. You may not get, ever get affirmation, the pat on the back. But guess what you've been called to do? Just like when your, your children or my children are rebellious and are acting a fool, you are still called to unselfishly love and to unselfishly serve. Friends, this is the picture that's being painted here. Again, may I make this point very clear, that if your motives are impure, that you miss the point. If our motives are set up on sharing Jesus with people, the reward is in full. It's going to be found in the kingdom. But if your motive is to be seen, to have a platform and the like, you got your clap right there. Congratulations. Lastly, friends, we, we mustn't wait for children to reach a certain age where we think they can understand the gospel. That means we don't send the children to children's church simply to want to be entertained. You send them because there is equipping that is happening in those classrooms. What do you do? You, you immerse them in the gospel at home. If we just simply entrust people to try to teach the children and you don't go to a Bible-centered church, then you've missed it. Because the reality is that should start at home. And then it carries over to the church. Friends, here's my prayer. and We'll close here. My prayer is this, is that as you minister, minister without blinders over your eyes. Tonight's a really simple message. It's not complicated. I'm not going, we're not going crazy deep. It's, it's very simple. God has called us to serve. He's called us to serve selflessly. Because if we're working towards trying to attain greatness in and of our own selves, we missed it. On the other hand, we have to recognize that like the little children, they too have an opportunity to come to know Christ. The question is, are you serving them well or are you not? May we see people just as Jesus does in the sense that all are in need to be served. Even those in whom the world deems unservable. For at the foot of the cross, both the beggar and the banking broker are on the same playing field. Both in need to be served and saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's so much truth regarding the entrance into the kingdom. That it's not built upon what we do. It's not built upon how good we think we are. It's built upon what you have freely and graciously done. Lord, I ask that you search our hearts. That the areas that we try to tuck away, that you'll show it the ugliness of ourselves so that we may respond in all things in grace. Lord, it amazes me how you exhibited such patience with the disciples. Time and time again they failed. Time and time again they dropped the ball. Time and time again they made bonehead mistakes. But yet your love was faithfully there, walking with them day by day. Lord, and even by your spirit today, you're doing that now. 
Lord, that when we see needs and opportunities in this world, especially during this time, this holiday season, will you help us to find the need and meet it? Not to discount individuals, but to bring them in by sharing the good news of your son coming to this world, wrapped in flesh, dying on the cross for our sins, that we may become the righteousness of God. Will you open our hearts and our eyes tonight to see these truths? In Jesus' name I pray, amen.